Good night from Metro Manila, the Philippines, Southeastern Asia. Here is an educational video about one of the uh, last great uh, ship collisions on the North American coast, or at least on North America's eastern coast, which happened in July 1956 between the luxurious Italian ocean liner SS Andrea Doria and the much plainer and clearly smaller Swedish ocean liner SS Stockholm. Andrea Doria sank some 11 hours after the collision. SS Stockholm was able to limp back despite its largely destroyed uh, bow um, back to the New York City Harbor and still actually exists as MV Astoria. So what had caused the collision? First, fog. Andrea Doria had been already many hours in the fog bank while uh, Stockholm had just started to enter it. The good thing was that the collision happened fairly near both Canada's and the United States coasts, or more specifically the United States uh, North Atlantic coast. It was already 1956, not 1916, which meant that virtually all ocean-going ships were equipped with both uh, a radio and a radar. And then ships were clearly faster than they were in the 1910s. And, um, of course, the fact that the ships... The stricken ships, in this case, Andrea Doria's sinking took 11 hours. And that it was summertime, not spring. So, for example, these factors helped. And that, of course, um, the shipbuilding technology had clearly advanced since the 1910s. All ocean-going ships had to carry a sufficient number of lifeboats Although, sadly, since the Andrea Doria was stricken on its side and it quickly, within a matter of minutes uh, from the collision, developed a 20-degree list. It meant that half of its uh, lifeboats were unusable. However, since there were so many ships near the uh, eastern coast or North Atlantic coast of the United States and near, therefore, the scene of accident, almost everyone on board could be saved. And fortunately, there were only 51 victims. So it was by no means as bad a uh, disaster, as horrible shipwreck as that of the Titanic. Although, of course, a deeply saddening one. So at 3 p.m. on the afternoon of Wednesday, July the 25th, 1956, the Italian ship's captain, Mr. Piero Calamai, stood on the bridge, or command bridge, staring to the west. And he noticed that the afternoon sun was headed toward a nebulous haze on the western horizon. As an experienced sailor, he knew that this meant fog. And therefore, he decided to take precautionary measures by reducing the ship's uh, speed from 23 knots or about 43 kilometers to 21.8 kilometers or about 40 kilometers. In addition, under his orders, the ship's foghorn started to sound its six second blast every one minute and 40 seconds to warn any approaching um, ships 
of the fog. One of the two radar units were switched on and checked for proper operation. The Stockholm, by contrast, had left Pier 97 in the New York City Harbor at 11.31 a.m. local time, and by nightfall it had already moved clearly away from New York, cruising ahead at a top speed of just 18 knots. Or... some 33 kilometers per hour. The ship's captain, Norden Sen, walked on the wings of the bridge in contemplation. Third officer, Karstens, was also on duty, checking the compass in front of the helmsman to make sure he was holding course steady at 90 degrees. At 9.40 p.m., sorry, the captain ordered a change of course to 87 degrees that would take them approximately one mile or 1.6 kilometers south of the Nantucket lightship uh, on the coast of Massachusetts. A few minutes later, Captain Nordensen left Karstens in command and went down to his cabin with instructions that if the ship entered the fog zone, he should be uh, informed of that. So Karstens was the ship's third mate, um, and he was also an experienced sailor. So he was to uh, use the standby sailor as lookout. He was to make sure that uh, at least one mile or 1.6 kilometers would be uh, the distance between the Stockholm and any ship passing it. And if he was to put the engine telegraph on standby and immediately inform the captain. The following sequence was pieced together from the book's collision course and saved. The events as originally reported in the books are in error. A corrected sequence of events has been presented here courtesy of Captain Robert J. Mern of the United States Merchant Marine Academy based on the findings of John C. Carothers or Carothers. At 9.30 p.m., <clears throat> Giannini on board the Andrea Doria spotted a pip on the radar 17 miles distant. or about 27 kilometers distant. Franchini took a Lauren fix on the Andrea Doria's position, then listened with the radio direction finder for the signal sent out by the Nantucket lightship, and reported to Captain Kalamai that the ship was headed directly toward the lightship. Kalamai then ordered a change of course to 261 degrees. Uh, that was to take them one mile or 1.6 kilometers south of the Nantucket lightship. At 10 sharp p.m. Stockholm time, according to the time of uh, the ship Stockholm, Karnstens took RDF readings from Block Island and the Nantucket lightship. The Nantucket lightship was broadcasting a special signal that was a coded warning that dangerous fog was in the area. Karstens seemed to be unaware uh, of the meaning of the radio signal, although it was recorded in a manual on board. At 10.04 p.m., Karstens plotting <coughs> showed the Stockholm to be two and a half miles or about four kilometers north of its intended course. At 10.20 p.m., on board the Andrea Doria, the telephone rang on the bridge. The forecastle lookout reported that he could hear a foghorn off the starboard bow. Uh, Franchini was following the movement of the pip, and he told Kalamai they were passing the lightship at a distance of one mile or 1.6 kilometers. 
column I ordered a course of 268, setting the Andrea Doria therefore on an almost straight western course directly toward New York City. Karstens at 10.30 p.m. on board the Stockholm took another position fix, showing that the Stockholm was farther off course to the north, 2.7 or 2.8 miles from its intended route, drifting in a strong current. <clears throat> Meaning approximately four kilometers. Uh, yeah, 4.3 to 4.5 kilometers north of its intended route. And he ordered a shifting course to two degrees to the south to compensate. At 10.40 p.m., the three seamen rotated duties and Peter Larsen took the helm. Karstens felt he should keep a close watch on the compass with Larsen at the helm because he believed the Danish sailor let his attention wander from strict observation of the compass needle. Also at 10.40 p.m. on board the Andrea Doria, Franchini shouted, it's a ship, we can see a ship, estimating that it was 17 miles or 27 kilometers away, four degrees on the starboard bow. The unknown ship was almost directly in front of the Andrea Doria's course, and what puzzled Franchini was that it was actually traveling east, not west because the oncoming ship was 20 miles or 32 kilometers north of the recommended eastbound route and was drifting slowly to the right for a safe starboard to starboard meeting. At 10.50 p.m. on board the Stockholm, Karstens took another RDF reading and the ship was now three miles or 4.8 kilometers off course to the north. He ordered Larsen to shift course an additional two degrees south which would put the ship on a heading of 91 degrees. At the same time on board the Andrea Doria, Franchini was tracking the bearing of the pip. If it continually increased to the north, it meant the other ship was on a course that would let it pass safely on the starboard side. If the bearing decreased, the ships were on a dangerous course and would have to take evasive action. The bearing was increasing and if both ships held their courses, they would pass safely starboard to starboard. According to this andreadoria.org website, when ships meet head on in the open sea, they are supposed to pass port to port, unless that would force them into a crossing course. Since the ship was already to the starboard side to the north, there seemed to be no reason to swing to the right for normal port to port passage. When the other ship was about seven miles or 11.2 kilometers ahead, Franchini switched the radar to a range of eight miles. Uh, yeah, 11.3 kilometers, so eight miles, 12.9 kilometers. Each reading seemed to confirm his observation that the other ship would pass safely on his starboard or right side. After being asked by Captain Kalamai, how close will she pass? Franchini replied about one mile, so 1.6 kilometers to starboard. At 11 sharp p.m. at the helm, Larsen reached up and pulled on a cord ringing six bells, 11 o'clock. Captain Urdensen heard the bells and knew that Stockholm would soon be approaching the Nantucket lightship and he would need to set a course for the open sea. He carefully put away his logbooks and diary and prepared to go back to the bridge. At 11.06 p.m., third mate Karstens detected the Andrea Doria to the right of heading flasher on radar after his third RDF fix. And unfortunately, he miscalculated the distance on the radar range. He believed it was 12 miles away meaning 19.3 kilometers away, because he thought he was looking at the 15 mile or 24.1 kilometer range uh, scale, but Andrea Doria in reality was only four miles or 6.4 kilometers away, 
on the five mile or eight kilometer scale. At the same time, when the other ship was three and a half miles or 5.6 kilometers away at a bearing of 15 degrees, Captain Kalamai ordered a turn of four degrees to port because he thought the swing to the left would open the gap between the two ships and allow them to pass starboard to starboard even farther than the one mile or 1.6 kilometer estimate. Kalamai and Giannini watched the horizon carefully on the starboard. It was important to make visual contact with the other ship as soon as possible for radar is at best an imprecise aid to navigation. Eyes are more trustworthy. I just wonder if they used binoculars, which definitely were available in 1956. At 11.08 p.m., Karstens on board the Stockholm ordered course change to starboard to a course of 118 degrees. At 11.09 p.m. also on board, the Stockholm Karstens looked at radar and detected Andrea Doria six miles or 9.7 kilometers away, thinking he was on a 15 mile or 24 kilometer scale. But actually, the Andrea Doria was only two miles or 3.2 kilometers away, as the third officer was in reality on the five mile or eight kilometer range scale. He detected contact on radar to left of heading flasher and ordered a further course change uh, to starboard to 133 degrees. Approximately at the same time, on board the Andrea Doria, Giannini studied the radar and saw the other ship at a distance of one and a half miles or 2.4 kilometers and at a bearing of 30 to 35 degrees off to the right. Going outside, he searched the starboard side with his binoculars, and suddenly he saw a blur of light some 35 degrees off to the right, just as the radar had indicated. On board the Stockholm, when the compass indicator moved 15 degrees, the mate ordered amidships in response, Larsen brought the wheel back to center. Finally, when the ships were about one mile or 1.6 kilometers apart, their uh, key crew members could see the other ship or the other ships. Because Giannini pointed his binoculars at the glow and strain to see the masthead lights. There were two of them, the lower one slightly to the right of the other. And still for a moment, Captain Kalamai thought the other ship would pass safely to the right. Giannini, however, suddenly realized the lower masthead light of the other ship was quickly swinging to the left of the higher masthead light. And the red light on the port side of the other ship was now visible for the first time. In other words, the other ship, Stockholm, was directly turning towards the Andrea Doria. Captain Kalamai decided to act quickly, ordering hard left. This was what he shouted at helmsman Giulio Viciano. It was the last daring attempt to outrun a disaster by turning the Andrea Doria to the left faster than the unknown vessel was turning to the right. Franchini blew two short whistle blasts to signal a left turn and straining under a hard left rudder, the Andrea Doria slid toward for perhaps half a mile or 800 meters before the turn took effect. Unfortunately, this last minute turn exposed the Andrea Doria's side like a target to the onrushing bow of the other vessel. At 11.30, at 11.10.30 p.m. on board the Stockholm, on the bridge, both Björkman and Karstens simultaneously saw a dramatic change in the unknown ship's navigational lights, staring into the darkness in disbelief. Karstens was horrified because he could see the other ship swinging into a hard left turn that was bringing it into a direct line with the Stockholm's course. Soon he saw the entire starboard side of the other ship in front of him, and he could see the sharp steel bow of his ship, after all, since uh, the Stockholm had been manufactured in Sweden, which uh, during 
almost all winters uh, experiences uh, quite heavy pack side uh, pack ice sorry on its eastern coast especially its northeastern coast uh, of the baltic sea while its western coast because of the more direct influence of the gulf stream is more ice free and of course back when the uh, Stockholm was constructed in the 1940s or early 1950s, the winters were colder than nowadays. That was why the uh, Stockholm's bow was built to be very solid so it could rake through ice. Um, he pulled hard on the telegraph indicator to full speed astern in order to reduce the force of the upcoming collision by reversing the engines. At the same moment, Karstens decided to turn the ship's bow away from the looming target, and he yelled hard starboard to Larsen, who was able to turn the wheel five full revolutions to the right and to hold it firmly in place. Karstens heard the unknown ship's whistle shriek a protest into the night. He also could hear the starboard screw finally spin backward, although he knew that this last minute maneuver was too late. And he prepared or braced himself for the upcoming collision, watching helplessly as his ship's white bow took aim on the starboard side of the Andrea Doria's black hull. On board the Andrea Doria at 11, 11, 15 p.m., uh, the horrified Captain Kalamai shouted, she's coming against us. The captain then instinctively drew back from the wing's railing. The intruder's bow seemed to point directly at him on the bridge, though he knew it would hit much lower, some 40 feet below. Or 12 meters below. And actually, for a moment, um, Captain Colum, I wished he was down there so he would not see the ship's demise because he would die on impact. And then the Stockholm struck the Andrea Doria. The two ships collided at almost a 90 degree angle, and the Stockholm sharply raked ice breaking pro pierced the Andrea Doria starboard side about one third of the other ship's length from the bow, penetrating the hull to a depth of nearly 40 feet or 12 meters and the keel. Below the waterline, five fuel tanks on the Andrea Doria's starboard side were torn open, filling with thousands of tons of seawater. At the same time, air was trapped in the five empty tanks on the port side. Why empty? Because the Andrea Doria was uh, about to finish its transatlantic crossing, causing them to float more readily, contributing to a severe list or leaning to one side. The Andrea Doria had been designed with its hull divided into 11 watertight compartments separated by steel bulkheads running across the width of its hull, rising from the bottom of the ship's hull up to A deck. The only openings in the bulkheads were on the bottom deck, where watertight doors were installed for use by the engine crew and could be easily closed in an emergency. The Andrea Doria's design specified that if any two adjacent watertight compartments were breached, the ship would remain afloat. Under the rules and guidelines set by the International Conference for Safety of Life at Sea in 1948, the Andrea Doria was designed to handle a list even under the worst imaginable circumstances, however, only up to 15 degrees. However, however since five flooded tanks were on one side, and five empty tanks were on the other side. The ship, within a few minutes of the collision, was listing at more than 20 degrees. 
The collision itself penetrated only one of Andrea Doria's watertight compartments, but the severe list gradually pulled the tops of the bulkheads along the starboard side below the water's level, allowing seawater to flow down corridors, down stairwells, and any other way it could find into the next compartment in line. The collision also tore into an access tunnel running from the generator room, which was located in the compartment directly aft of where the collision had happened, to a small room at the forward end of the tank compartment containing the uh, tank pumps controls. Initial radio distress calls were sent out by both ships, and in that way they learned each other's identities. Soon afterward, the messages were received by numerous radio and coast guard stations along the New England or northeastern United States coast. And the world soon became aware that the two large ocean liners had collided. The Andrea Doria sent the following SOS or Save Our Souls call. S-O-S-D-E-I-C-E-H. This is Andrea Doria. SOS here at 30320 GMT. Latitude or Greenwich, Greenwich Mean Time, latitude 40 degrees, 30 minutes north, 69 degrees, 53 uh, minutes west. Need immediate assistance. Immediately after the collision, the Andrea Doria began to take on water and started to list severely to star starboard. And within minutes, the list was at least 18. Alamai quickly brought the engine controls to all stop. In the engine room, engineers attempted to pump water out of the flooding starboard tanks. This didn't work. Aboard Stockholm, roughly 30 feet or 10 meters of its bow had been crushed and torn away. A quick survey determined that the uh, major damage did not extend beyond the bulkhead between the first and second watertight compartments. Therefore, the Stockholm remained stable and was not in an Im imminent danger of sinking. Within 30 minutes of the collision, the uh, captain of Andrea Doria made the decision to abandon the ship. Half of the lifeboats, because of the ship's severe list, were unusable. Instead of loading lifeboats at the side of the promenade deck and then lowering them into the water, it would be necessary to lower the boats empty and somehow get evacuees down the ship's exterior to water level to board, which eventually was accomplished through hope, ropes and Jacob's ladders. A distress message was relayed to other ships by radio making it clear that additional lifeboats were urgently needed. The first ship to respond to the Andrea Doria's distress call was the 120-meter or 390-foot freighter Cape Ann of the United Fruit Company, which was returning to the United States after a trip to Bremerhaven, West Germany. With a crew of 44 aboard and only two 40-person lifeboats, the assistance Cape Ann could offer was limited, but within minutes she was joined by other ships heading, heeding the distress call. The U.S. Navy transport USNS Private William H. Thomas, which was sailing to New York City from Livorno, Italy, and had 214 uh, soldiers and dependents, also responded to the signal and immediately progressed towards the collision site. That ship's captain, John Shee, or Shea, was placed in charge of the rescue operation by the U.S. Navy and readily ordered his crew to prepare their eight usable lifeboats. Also joining the rescue were the U.S. Navy destroyer escort USS Edward H. Allen. 81 kilometers or 44 knots east of the collision site, the French lines SS Ile de France, Ile de France is the formal name of the Paris metropolitan region, was eastbound from New York City en route to its home port of Le Havre, France. 
with 940 passengers and 826 crew members on board. That ship was 739 feet or 225 meters long and 30 years old. And at the time, it was among the largest passenger liners on the North Atlantic um, Ocean Liners routes. Captain Raoul de Baudin, a well-respected veteran of the seas who had served the French line for 35 years, was commanding the ship. De Baudin was at first skeptical of the thought of a modern ship like the Andrea Doria actually sinking um, but eventually he uh, decided to participate in the rescue operations and attempted to contact the Andrea Doria to learn more about the situation. That was unsuccessful. However, he was able to contact the Stockholm, the Cape, and the Cape and, and the Thomas. And he quickly realized how severe the situation was and that over 1,600 people were in danger of drowning. So he quickly turned the Ile de France around and set a direct course towards the stricken Andrea Doria. Many of the eight usable lifeboats of the Andrea Doria left the ship only partly loaded with about 200 panicked crewmen and very few passengers. While the other ships were nearby uh, sailing towards the stricken Andrea Doria, Captain Nordenson of Stockholm, having determined that his ship was not in any imminent danger of sinking, and after being assured of his mostly sleeping passengers' safety, sent some of his lifeboats to supplement the starboard boats from the Andrea Doria. Radio communications included relays from the other ships as the Andrea Doria's radios had limited range. The U.S. Coast Guard from New York City also coordinated on land. Arriving at the scene under three hours after the collision, Captain de Baudillon became concerned about navigating his huge ship safely between the two damaged liners, other responding vessels, lifeboats, and possibly even people in the water. Fortunately, the fog lifted just as the Ile de France arrived to the scene, and therefore the captain was able to position his ship in such a way that the Andrea Doria starboard side was somewhat sheltered. He ordered all the exterior lights of the Ile de France to be turned on, and this sight was a great emotional relief to many participants, crew, and passengers. The Ile de France managed to rescue the bulk of the remaining passengers by shuttling its 10 lifeboats back and forth to the Andrea Doria, and by receiving lifeboat loads from those of the other ships already at the scene, as well as the remaining starboard boats from the Andrea Doria. Some passengers of the Ile de France gave up their cabins to be used by the wet and tired survivors from the sinking Andrea Doria. In all, 1,663 passengers and crew members had been rescued from the Andrea Doria. The badly damaged Stockholm took on a total of 545 survivors. 129 survivors were rescued by the Cape Anne, 159 by the private William H. Thomas, 77 by the Edward H. Allen, including Captain Kalamai and his officers, and then one very fortunate American sailor who slept through the entire collision and evacuation had been lucky enough to be rescued from the abandoned sinking liner by the tanker Robert E. Hopkins. Ile de France actually accommodated 753 survivors. Shortly after daybreak, a four-year-old Italian girl with head trauma and four seriously injured Stockholm crewmen were airlifted from that ship at the scene by helicopter sent by the Coast Guard and U.S. Air Force. A number of passengers and some crew were hospitalized upon arrival in New York City. Once the evacuation was complete, Captain Kalamai on the Andrea Doria still considered the possibility of towing the ship to shallow water. 
However, the Andrea Doria was listing too heavily um, for that operation to be realistic. By 9 a.m. the following morning, July the 26th, 1956, even Captain Kalamai was in a rescue boat. At 9.45 a.m., the final phase of the sinking began, and by 10 a.m., the Andrea Doria was on its side at a right angle to the sea. The starboard side dipped into the ocean, meaning the North Atlantic Ocean, and the three remaining swimming pools were seen refilling with water. As the bow slid under, the stern rose slightly, and the port propeller and shaft became visible. As the port side slipped below the waves, some of the unused lifeboats snapped free of their davits and floated upside down in a row. It was recorded that the Andrea Doria finally sank bow first 10 hours after the collision. At 10.09 a.m. on July the 26th, 1956, the ship had drifted 1.58 nautical miles or 2.93 kilometers from the point of the collision in those hours. Aerial photography of the stricken ocean liner capsizing and sinking won a Pulitzer Prize in 1957 for Harry A. Trask of the Boston Traveler newspaper. This was the last major um, sinking of an ocean liner uh, near the U.S. coast because already later in the 1950s, air travel uh, started to become much more common for the people who wanted to cross the North Atlantic, whether from North America to Europe or vice versa. Already because even the airplanes, <clears throat> the propeller airplanes of that time were much faster than even the fastest ocean liners. Several months of hearings were held in New York City in the aftermath of the collision. Prominent wartime attorneys represented both ship's owners. Dozens of attorneys represented victims and families of victims. Officers of both ship lines had testified, including the officers in charge of each ship when the collision occurred. With more scheduled to appear later until an out-of-court settlement was reached and the hearings suddenly ended. Each line absorbed its own damages. For the Swedish American line, damages were estimated at 2 million US dollars at that time, half for repairs to the Stockholm's bow and half for the lost business during the repairs. The Italian line sustained the loss of the Andrea Doria's full value, estimated to be 30 million US dollars of that time. Heavy fog was given as the primary cause of the accident. And it is not disputed that intermittent and heavy fog are both frequent and challenging conditions for mariners in that part of the ocean as the warm Gulf Stream from the Caribbean Sea meets the cold Labrador current. So that causes fog on the uh, northeastern coast of the United States and much of the eastern coast of Canada to the north. There were, however, the following other factors. One, the Andrea Doria's officers had not followed proper radar procedures or used the plotting equipment that they had in their chart room um, beside the bridge to plot and then calculate the course, position and speed of the other approaching ship. Therefore, they did not realize how fast the Stockholm was sailing and what its exact course was until it was too late to change course and avoid the collision. Two, the Andrea Doria had not followed the long-established rule that vessels approaching head-to-head -head both turned towards the right, to starboard. As the Stockholm turned right, the Andrea Doria turned left, closing the circle instead of opening it. Three, Captain Kalamai of the Andrea Doria was deliberately speeding in heavy fog, although he had slightly reduced the ship's speed or ordered it to be slightly reduced. 
an admittedly common practice on passenger liners. Four, the Stockholm and the Andrea Doria were experiencing different weather conditions immediately before the collision. The Andrea Doria had been engulfed in fog for approximately eight hours, <clears throat> but the Stockholm had only recently entered the bank or between seven and eight hours and was still uh, adjusting to atmospheric conditions. The officer in charge of the Stockholm incorrectly assumed that his inability to see the other vessel was due to conditions other <clears throat> than fog, such as the other ship being a very small fishing vessel or a blacked out warship on maneuvers. Five, the Andrea Doria's fuel tanks were half empty and not pumped with seawater ballast to stabilize the ship in accordance with the Italian line's procedures. Six, a watertight door possibly was missing between bulkheads near the engine room, which was thought to have contributed to the Andrea Doria's problems of stability. Seven, the Stockholm's navigating officer mid-read, misread his radar, thinking he was on a 15 nautical mile or 28 kilometer setting, when in reality, the radar was set for five nautical miles or nine kilometers. So he thought he was farther from the Andrea Doria than he actually was. <clears throat> he did not inform his captain until it was too late. As a result of the Andrea Doria Stockholm collision, there were several rule changes in the immediate years following the incident. Shipping lines were required to improve training on the use of radar equipment. Approaching ships were required to make radio contact with one another. Marine craft today are required to turn to starboard right in a head-on situation. Of course, there are unanswered questions these nearly 64 years later. The fact that the Andrea Doria and the Stockholm were speeding in heavy fog at 21.8 knots and 18.5 knots, respectively, and then questions about their seaworthiness. Captain Calamai never again commanded another ship because the Italian line feared that it would get negative publicity. Many years later, a scientific study of the actions of the two crews indicated that probably the third mate on the Stockholm misinterpreted his radar in the minutes before the impact. <clears throat> <clears throat> Exploration of the Andrea Doria's wreck revealed that the Stockholm's bow had ripped a much larger gash in the critical area of the large fuel tanks and watertight compartments of the Italian liner than had been thought in 1956. <clears throat> Since the Andrea Doria is so near the surface, uh, it stopped initially lying in 160 feet or 50 meters of water. It has been a frequent target of treasure drivers and has been commonly referred to as the Mount Everest of scuba diving. However, over 60 years after the collision, uh, the Andrea Doria's wreck has aged and deteriorated much with flea field flows out from the liner's hull. In 2016, an expedition to the wreck by Ocean Gate revealed that the Andrea Doria was decaying rapidly. Several books have been written about the Andrea Doria such as Collision Course, published in 1959. Then Captain of the Eel saved the story of the Andrea Doria. Deep Descent, Adventure and Death, Diving the Andrea Doria. Desperate Hours, the Epic Rescue of the Andrea Doria, Shadow Divers. The Lost Ships of Robert Ballard. 
and arrive on the Andrea Doria, the greatest sea rescue in history. Several documentaries have been produced, for example, by the National Geographic Channel, the public broadcasting services, Secrets of the Dead, Discovery Channel, History Channel, and others.